It's, it's a pleasure to be here today. I just want to say thank you to everyone for giving me the chance to, to share with you today. Uh, it's been about six years since I've been to a design conference, uh, so I thought it made sense to go to two in one, in one month. So I was, at, I was at Config in SF, so it was, it's nice to be here. I'm from the UK, so it's nice to kind of see familiar faces and, and kind of share with you. So my name is Timothy. I'm a design director at Microsoft, but I also run a small design um, studio called Akuko Labs, where I sell and design mechanical keyboards and keycaps. So a lot, a lot like you guys, during the pandemic, I was thinking a lot about upgrading my home setup, working from home a lot. And um, I didn't know it then, but buying a mechanical keyboard would take me down a path that would completely reshape my creative career. And it all started with one tweet, kind of turned a bit into a, a creative endeavor, a side hustle, a business, and now a realization of a dream that I always had. Now, I had no ideas about keyboards, but I was interested. I watched a YouTube video one day um, and saw um, sort of the how you could build them and put them together, and it really piqued my interest. And considering I worked behind a computer every single day, it was kind of surprising that I hadn't thought about it up until that point. And so I tweeted out to my followers asking for some suggestions, and I did get one reply from a friend called Tim Van Dam, who gave me some ideas, but more importantly, invited me to his Discord community, and that was the beginning of my fall into a very deep, very expensive rabbit hole. OK, so fast forward a few weeks, and the first keyboard arrives. This is the Keychron Q2, 65% mechanical keyboard. The first thing that really stood out to me was how heavy it was. This was completely made of aluminum, and I think the thing that I really fell in love with was just how I could build this myself. I could choose the switches, the plate, the keycaps. I could tune the, the typing feel and the sound. This is so different from what I was doing day to day as a digital designer. This is so much more physical and tactile, and I ultimately fell in love. And considering it was COVID, I had a lot of time on my hands at home. So as you can imagine, one became two. So I started taking photos and experimenting with different builds and different lighting positions and you know, trying to get a sense of how I could make sure I shoot this device as far away from a desk as possible. I made an Instagram account and started to share these photos. And quickly after that, two became three. But I had this one nagging question in my mind, and I bet it's one that you've probably all had yourselves, especially when you enter in a space that really inspires you or makes you kind of really intrigued, like, what if I designed my own? Now, I'd never designed anything physical before. I had no experience in physical product design, very little or basically no 3D modeling skills and zero understanding of how to manufacture these things. But I was a designer, like all of you. I did have one tool that I used every single day to express myself, to take my ideas into something real, and that was Figma. And so I thought maybe that could be a good place to start. And so today, I want to talk a little bit about my journey into this space, some of the projects I've worked on up until now, and some of the things I've learned along the way like how starting without certainty kind of helped me find momentum, how nurturing a small idea into a big, complete system expanded my creativity. But I guess most importantly, how finding purpose in the work gave me courage to pursue a dream. OK, so let's start from, from the beginning. So I didn't really know where to start had a bit of a blank, a blank canvas. And in the hobby, there were kind of a, an emerging pattern that I saw. Basically, in the middle, you have these alpha keys. That's what they're called. These are the main keys, A, B, C, you know, those ones. They were all like one color. And then the modifiers, which were kind of on the outside, shift and enter and backspace, like these ones were all a different color. And then you'd have these things called novelty keys, which are usually illustrations um, to try and tie the whole set together. 
Uh, maybe because I, I just couldn't draw, I didn't know how to draw, or maybe because I was new to the hobby and didn't really feel connected to that, that existing convention. I just wanted to do something a little bit different. And there were some projects that I saw that really did inspire me, like this. This is uh, PBT Raw by BIP. I think it's just amazing how he broke from tradition. He was created something that was fun, expressive, uh, unexpected. And so it made me think, actually, there is space and room to try something different here. Or this, a set designed by a good friend, Tim Van Dam, called Terminal. And what really stood out to me here was his ability to build a world around the set. It wasn't just about colors on plastic. There was a narrative, there was a story, and it made me realize that like, it can be more than just, just a, a, you know, I can, I can create maybe moments of expression in, in these little pieces of plastic. Okay, so I had kind of like a good sense of where I wanted to go, but I still didn't have an idea. I've always loved Bauhaus, so it was nice to kind of see Dylan talk about it at the beginning. I've always loved Bauhaus, and ever since living in Berlin and visiting the archive, I've just been fascinated by the design philosophy, but more importantly, amazed by all the amazing art and furniture and architecture that's come out of the movement. The use of color and geometry, and I thought maybe this could be the foundation for, for my first keycap set. You know, what if I could take some primary colors and some primitive shapes and try to construct letter forms from these basic ingredients. Basically, each key would kind of be its own design challenge, and together it might form that kind of bigger story that I was looking for. And so, Gestalt was born. So I definitely leaned more into the artistic expression than function. Um, I didn't really focus too much on making every single uh, legend or letter uh, legible, I guess. And so it did have its benefits as well, though. Um, I was trying to get better at typing, and so these keycaps makes it really easy, because looking down at your keyboard won't be very helpful <laughs> at all. But it, you know, this is kind of where it ended, and it didn't start that way. It started in a much more messy place, exploring, experimenting with shapes and colors, and trying to figure out like what's the best combination. And Figma was obviously great for that because it is collaborative, and so I could invite my like, keyboard friends who, who are in the Discord to get their opinion about you know, being, being in the space. They have a, a, a perspective that's different from my normie friends who haven't been you know, <laughs> taken into that crazy world, who could kind of look at it from a more design individual point of view. And Figma allowed for that feedback and that back and forth without losing that momentum. And so over some time, kept iterating, and I landed on a, a bunch of legends that I felt pretty good about. So I thought, well, now I have a set. Let me try and put them into the shape of a keyboard. But before I could even finish that, I was like, no, I need to see this in 3D. I need to kind of feel it. It needs to be more tactile. Luckily enough, there was a Blender add-on uh, floating around in the, in the community, the keyboard community, called Keyboard Render Kit. And it looks a bit intense, but basically all you have to do is create a simple UV map like this, press a few buttons uh, in Blender, and you get this. Your designs projected onto 3D models of keycaps. But this is great because now I was, in, I was in 3D, this was the physical form. I could check out different angles and different sort of distances and see how different light conditions affected the design. And the great thing about this plugin is that it also had some keyboard assets too, so I could you know, experiment with different layouts and see which one I liked the best, and also try different colors and see how that would work. And as I, get, as I became more comfortable in, in Blender, kind of you know, messing around with these little small details, I started modeling too. And so this is kind of always inspired by the Bauhaus movement. These are the nesting tables by Marcel Breuer. So I, I modeled these, it's kind of one of the first things I, I modeled, experimenting with like, again, like composition and camera positions, and it was so much fun just playing in this space. I even designed a keyboard too, and so this is an upcoming project that I, that I have called the Slab 65, which was originally designed just to show off Gestalt. But because of the interest, I was like, maybe we could make it, make it for real. But back to Gestalt. Once I refined the idea further and felt really good about it, I thought, like, this is, it's time to now maybe share it with the world and maybe see 
if um, people, people like it. And so just like my friend Tim, I was like, let me try and create a world around this, a narrative, like a visual story. So what kind of environment should this be in? What should the lighting feel like? How can I make this feel like, you know, given that kind of mixture of like minimal and cold and a little bit warm from the Bauhaus movement? I started messing around with some, you know, physics simulations as well, very simple stuff in Blender. But once I felt good about everything that I kind of put together, all these different renders, I posted it online to gauge interest. And I was surprised to see a lot of people uh, from the hobby and also outside of it were kind of interested in it. And so much so that vendors who usually handle the selling and shipping and you know, manufacturing reached out and said, hey, do you want some help making this thing for, for real? And so fast forward a bunch of months and many samples and a few factory changes, Gestalt wasn't just an idea anymore. It was actually real. It was manufactured, it was sold, it was shipped. It was in people's hands. It was in my hands, like a thing that I had thought about making and made and now is, is, is in physical form, and that was amazing. So I learned a ton of stuff working on Gestalt, but I think maybe the one thing that stood out to me the most was this. Like, it's okay to start with what you know. Like, you don't have to wait until you know everything before you get going. Sometimes the tools you already have at your disposal can, can get you going. But in all honesty, I wouldn't have been able to take this over the finish line without the support from the friends and people in the community and these vendors who reached out and provided support. And so, you know, having that initial idea and, and putting it out there created the opportunity for others to come in and help me take it further. So, just now taught me about sort of getting going and, and how to be creative inside boundaries. But what happens when you loosen those boundaries and you let an idea grow more freely. So this is Motif, the kind of second project or maybe a response to, to Gestalt, something that, you know, trying to respond to the very structured and sort of formulaed, formulaed nature of, of Gestalt, something that's a bit more free, a bit more expressive, a little bit more playful, embracing more color and softness and, and movement and joy, kind of maybe guided more by feeling than, than formula. It started off as a color palette, but quickly evolved into a lot more. You know, I designed a, a keycap set, and through a bunch of collaborations, I designed a keyboard, some cables, some artisan um, keycaps, and kind of this all came together, sort of starting from this initial foundation, you know, a, a design system, basically. And I made these components of all the different variations, of all the different keys, and all the different sizes. And this is a great way to kind of build on, on the idea, and so I could easily create um, production assets, which would then be used by the manufacturer to help decide sort of how to put the, the set together. I used the same components to design the website as well and sort of figure out how to present the work. And when thinking about packaging, those same components came in handy. And even this Figma plugin, 2Path, was also helpful to kind of get that you know, easy, clean uh, text along path. I did not have Figma Draw back then. And Figma was great as a communication tool, too. I could easily, you know, mock something up or sketch it out and give it to my CAD designer and say, hey, look, how about we make the bottom of the keyboard like this? We could put these shapes here, and we can put the logo there. And he could then use that as maybe an SVG or, or DXF to kind of like give him guides for actually how to, how to model it. And because this project had so many collaborators, I made this little brand guide as well and kind of helping them figure out, okay, how should this project um, kind of what, what kind of vibe are we going with and, and what should it look like and, you know, how can we kind of tell that same story? So when I, you know, first designed or thought about making Motif, all I cared about, all I thought about was designing a keycap set. But because of the interest it got from people outside the hobby asking me, hey, when is this keyboard coming out? And I had to tell them, well, no, it's not a keyboard, it's just the keycap set. I had to kind of like think and go, well, maybe Maybe I could make a keyboard, why not? Maybe I could also make a cable as well while, while we're at it. And sort of reaching people outside the hobby is, a, is kind of a big goal of mine in the work that I do. I want to try and make this hobby feel approachable and normal and like you can craft beautiful things, you can have things that are considered. These keyboards aren't just utilitarian devices, they can be a way of expression and kind of reach those people who never really considered keyboards in the first place, like I did before I joined the hobby. 
And so each piece was kind of added, and it felt like a continuation of the original idea, because I feel like we had a very strong initial foundation, a very simple idea, but a, but a strong foundation. And I believe that. I feel like simple ideas are powerful, but being open in allowing sort of that idea to grow organically, I think can really lead you down unexpected places. So having ideas with a, with a good, strong foundation makes it super easy to actually build on. And sometimes the best things that we make are the things we never really planned to make in the first place. OK, so Motif has probably pushed me further than I've ever you know, pushed myself before. You know, five different individual products as part of one collection, it was a challenge. And I learned a lot about manufacturing and working with, you know, working with other factories and collaborating with other creators. And, but I think the one thing that, I, that stood out to me that I think about now and maybe use as a way of closing is this. Who knows what this is? People don't? Yeah, yeah. I think we've all kind of once done the donut course once or twice before. I think I've done it like 10 times, probably. Each time Blender has a new version, Blender Guru you know, releases a new tutorial, and I do it like clockwork. But for some reason, I had, I've had that passion and curiosity, but never really found a way of making it follow through. Like I lacked the drive in some ways or something to really fully, drive, fully dive in. I think I was missing something. I think I was missing purpose. And I think this hobby really gave me that purpose. It was like a real thing that like, mattered to me that I cared about. I think it kind of gave me the momentum to go past those donut courses. And Figma played a really unexpected role in that, too. Figma gave me the confidence to take some of my ideas further. Although I didn't have the tools at the time, I had this, this one thing that I could use to express myself. And out of just creative compulsion, I was like, well, I need to take this further. I need to push it past where, I, where it is today. So I need to learn 3D. I need to you know, figure out more about manufacturing processes, because if I don't, this thing's going to die, and I can't let it die. So whether it's thinking about how to make packaging for some switches, where you know, designing in Figma, then model it in Shape of 3D, and have a friend 3D print them, or trying to marry two of my favorite things, like photography and, and keyboards, into a, a photography-inspired keycap set, which is now in production, or thinking back about my first project and thinking, how do I design something that people don't want to throw away? How can this packaging be something that people would like to look at? All these ideas started in, in, in Figma, but they didn't end there. They, they went further. I feel like being in a comfortable environment can, can actually spark courage. Sounds a bit counterintuitive, but I think that kind of creates a momentum, and it kind of creates a drive within you, that creative drive, to dive into the unknown. And so one evening, I opened Figma just to explore a simple idea. And that tiny step led me here, you know, developing new skills, starting a side business, and basically realizing a creative dream that I've long carried. So I want to leave you with just one, one simple question. What's that one idea that you've been sitting on? And what's that one little step that you can take, maybe in a tool that you already know, that could get you that one step closer to one of your dreams? Thank you.